But now we need to get into certain contemporary issues with the Second Amendment. And first and foremost, we have to deal with the language and grammatical structure controversy. Because apparently people these days don't know how to read or comprehend language and historical context. So there are people who actually believe that the Second Amendment only allows the right of the people in a militia to keep and bear arms. And this is where we get into grammar Nazi territory and have to analyze each and every phrase of the Second Amendment. But to preface, you need to understand that words mean what they mean when they were written. Now thankfully, the late Justice Antonin Scalia did most of the research for this next part in his opinion of the court on DC versus Heller. First, let's get into the prefatory and operative clauses, both of which are present in the language of the Second Amendment. A prefatory clause announces a purpose, while the operative clause announces the resolution or action to be taken or not taken. And here's how the clauses are split up in the Second Amendment. Let's start with the operative clause and dissect it phrase by phrase. The right of the people. This phrase is used two other times in the Bill of Rights, once in the First Amendment and once in the Fourth Amendment. And there's also similar phrasing in the Ninth Amendment. But each time it is used, it is used unambiguously to describe individual rights, not collective rights, or rights that can only be exercised through participation in some corporate body, or a militia. There are three other provisions in the Constitution that strictly use the phrase, the people. Once in the Preamble, once in Article 1, Section 2, and once in the Tenth Amendment. And in each of those instances, the phrasing of the people is not used in the context of individual rights, but collective powers, powers that belong to the people. In each of these instances, the people refers to the exercising or reservation of powers, such as the reserving of power to people in the 10th Amendment, or the exercising of powers in Article 1, Section 2. Not rights, powers. Nowhere else in the Constitution does a right attributed to the people refer to anything other than an individual right. What's more is that in all instances of the phrase, the people, it is used in reference to a class of people who are members of a national community or connection with this country. Meaning that when we say the people, we are not referring to subsets of people, like people in a militia, but are referring to the whole people. This is in opposition to the prefatory clause when it mentions the militia, as a militia is a subset of people. So reading the Second Amendment as protecting only the right to keep and bear arms in an organized militia therefore fits poorly with the operative clause's description of the holder of that right as the people. Another thing to understand about prefatory and operative clauses is that a prefatory clause does not limit or expand the scope of an operative clause. In fact, as stated in a general treatise on statutes by Sir Fortunatus Duarez from 1848, it is nothing unusual in Acts for the enacting part to go beyond the preamble. The remedy often extends beyond the particular act or mischief which first suggested the necessity of the law. And in regards to the English court case Coatman v. Gallant in 1716, the Lord Chancellor Hardwick stated that I can by no means allow of the notion that the preamble shall restrain the operation of the enacting clause, and that because the preamble is too narrow or defective, therefore the enacting clause, which has general words, shall be restrained from its full latitude and from doing that good which the words would otherwise and of themselves import. So when you talk about something particular, like a militia, that doesn't then constrain the following phrase of the people into the context of a militia, meaning that the Second Amendment protects an individual right of all Americans. So now we move on to the phrase to keep and bear arms. Let's start with the word arms. The 18th century meaning of the word arms is the exact same meaning as it is today. In the 1773 edition of Samuel Johnson's dictionary, it defined the word arms as weapons of offense or armor of defense. And the 1771 legal dictionary by Timothy Cunningham defined the word arms as anything that a man wears for his defense or takes into his hands or useth in wrath to cast at or strike another. And even the 1828 Webster's American Dictionary of the English language also uses the same phrasing. And even today's Webster's definition of the word arms is the exact same as it was back then. The word arms, then as now, does not apply only to military service or service in connection to a militia. In fact, here's an example sentence from Timothy Cunningham's 1771 Legal Dictionary. Servants and laborers shall use bows and arrows on Sundays and not bear other arms. Even the 1783 thesaurus titled the distinction between words synonymous in the English language, while it may have limited the term arms to instruments of offense generally made use of in war, it also states that arms constitute all firearms. At this point, some of you might be seeing now how this intersects with the it only applies to muskets argument. We'll get to that in a bit, but let's finish off this militia argument. So now let's dig into the meaning of the word keep. 
Going back to the 1783 thesaurus, it defines the word keep as we keep what we intend not to part with. We keep that which is our own. And the 1773 edition of a dictionary of the English language defines it as to retain, not to lose, and to have in custody. So now knowing what arms means, to keep arms can most naturally be read as to have weapons. Now there's no specific phrasing of to keep arms in a dictionary, but the way the phrase was commonly used and referred to was as a way of possessing arms, both individually and also in regards to a militia. Some people cite laws in Delaware, New Jersey, and Virginia that stated the phrase keep arms in the context of a militia, meaning that you can only use the phrase keep arms when talking about a militia. But Justice Scalia points out that that's like saying that because there are many statutes that authorize aggrieved employees to file complaints with federal agencies, that the phrase file complaints has an employee-related connotation, and that you can't file a complaint for any other reason if you're not an employee of an institution. Yeah, that doesn't quite work, guys. Moving on to the next phrase of bear, this has always, then and now, meant to carry. Here's that 1773 dictionary again. But when used in the context of arms, good old Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg seems to have given a very good descriptor of its meaning in Muscarello vs. United States when analyzing the meaning of the phrase carries a firearm. In that case, she wrote, Surely, a most familiar meaning is, as the Constitution's Second Amendment indicates, wear, bear, or carry, upon the person or in the clothing or in a pocket, for the purpose of being armed and ready for offensive or defensive action in a case of conflict with another person. Nowhere here is the act of bearing arms mentioned in relation to service in a militia or other organized military unit. Moreover, in nine state constitutional provisions written in the 18th century or the first two decades of the 19th, they enshrined a right of the citizens to bear arms in defense of themselves and the state, or bear arms in defense of himself and the state. It is clear from those formulations that bear arms did not refer only to carrying a weapon in an organized military unit. When Justice James Wilson analyzed the Pennsylvania Constitution's arms-bearing right, he also recognized it as a natural right of self-preservation and defense of one's person or house. Once again, this is an individual right not limited to service in a militia. There is no dictionary that defines the phrase bear arms only in relation to military service, and there are numerous instances of its usage in non-military affairs, such as the already mentioned example sentence from Cunningham's 1771 Legal Dictionary. So any usage of the phrase bear arms in military contexts do not limit the term to that context. This is important because the former Justice John Paul Stevens and the dissent in the DC vs. Heller case pointed to a study by various professors of linguistics and English that cited 110 instances of the phrase bear arms being used in the context of military service. So according to them, the phrase bear arms can only mean the carrying of arms for military purposes. This is how the dissent decided to reason. Well, if the founders wanted to say that all people have the right to carry arms, they should have made a qualifier after bear arms and written something like the right to bear arms for all citizens of America, not in a militia or something. But as Antonin Scalia points out, this makes absolutely no sense. If the idea is that bear arms can only mean to carry arms for military purposes, then you can't add a modifier to that statement outside of military purposes because it would blatantly contradict the phrase it is trying to modify. So a sentence like the right to bear arms for the purpose of killing game, which was a sentence that these professors decided to exclude, in this context would be like something out the mouth of a moron. So you can only carry a weapon for military purposes to hunt animals? <laughs> yeah, no. Bear arms means to carry arms or possess arms or have arms. And the fact that you can modify with purposive qualifiers objectively means that it is not limited to military use. But also, the phrase bear arms has a different idiomatic meaning when you place the word against after it, which directs hostilities towards a target for the purposes of war, fighting, military service, or serving as a soldier. And in nearly all of the examples that the professors of linguistics and English gave, they include the word against after bear arms. Now obviously, if these professors and linguists decided to give bear arms this idiomatic meaning, to bear arms would cause the protected right to consist of the right to be a soldier or to wage war, an absurdity that no commentator has ever endorsed. Which is why they, and Justice Stevens, created a hybrid meaning of the phrase bear arms to mean to carry arms in connection with service in the military, or in this case, a militia. Again, no dictionary anywhere has ever taken on this meaning of bear arms. 
Antonin Scalia also writes that worse still, the phrase keep and bear arms would be incoherent. The word arms would have two different meanings at once. Weapons, as the object of keep, and as the object of bear, one half of an idiom. It would be rather like saying he filled and kicked the bucket to mean he filled the bucket and died. For those viewers watching who are not well accustomed to the English language, another meaning of the phrase kick the bucket means to die. But even in the original English Bill of Rights, which was again the primary source of inspiration, there was no mention of an individual right to bear arms in relation to a militia. In fact, William Blackstone in his commentaries on the laws of England from 1765 made no mention of military service or militia when he talked about the natural right of resistance and self-preservation and the right of having and using arms for self-preservation and defense. Nowhere here does he talk about this natural right of self-preservation and defense in regards to the formation and service in a militia. Thus, the right secured in 1689 as a result of the Stuarts' abuses was by the time of the founding understood to be an individual right protecting against both public and private violence. And no word games on the meaning of bear arms and keep and right of the people is going to change that historical and textual context. So now let's shift back over to the prefatory clause and analyze each of these words and make sure they're in concordance with what was just described in the operative clause. A well-regulated militia. All right, well, let's go back to Webster's 1828 dictionary again. The militia of a country are the able-bodied men organized into companies, regiments, and brigades with officers of all grades and required by law to attend military exercises on certain days only, but at other times left to pursue their usual occupations. In Federalist 46, James Madison, a founding father, specifically wrote about a militia amounting to near half a million of citizens with arms in their hands, officered by men chosen from among themselves, fighting for their common liberties, and united and conducted by governments possessing their affections and confidence. Thomas Jefferson, another founding father, in his letter to Destute de Tracy, wrote about the militia of the state, that is to say, of every man in it able to bear arms. Even in the 1939 Supreme Court case of the U.S. v. Miller, the court still retained this definition of a militia when explaining that the militia comprised all males physically capable of acting in concert for the common defense. So as clearly stated here, the militia is all of the people. This was another point that was contested by the dissent in D.C. v. Heller, because according to them, the militia is a federal creation, and they point to Article 1, Section 8 to justify this. But see, if you actually read Article 1, Section 8, you see that Congress has only allowed the power to raise and support armies and to provide and maintain a navy. But when they talk about the militia, they say that Congress has the power to provide for calling forth the militia. Which means that the militia is already something that exists, and that Congress has the ability to organize the militia, not a militia. Which connotes that the militia is a body that already exists and is not something that the federal government can just create. And this is something that Congress has already done with the first Militia Act of 1792, which specified that each and every free able-bodied white male citizen of the respective states resident therein, who is or shall be of the age of 18 years and under the age of 45 years, except as hereinafter accepted, shall severally and respectively be enrolled in the militia. Now it's also important to note that this act, and the subsequent acts following it, do not define what the militia is, over just organizing together a subset of the militia, as allowed by Article 1, Section 8. But the federal government has no requirement to organize all of them together, and so they can focus on the subset that they see the most use in when calling forth the militia. Next is the phrase, well-regulated, which means nothing other than the imposition of proper discipline and training. This same imposition was used in the Virginia Declaration of Rights from 1776 when stating that a well-regulated militia composed of the body of the people trained to arms is the proper, natural, and safe defense of a free state. It does not mean federal government regulation like we know it today, or regulation from a governmental bureaucracy. If that was the case, the Second Amendment would have been framed as a militia well-regulated by the Congress being necessary to the security of a free state. Obviously, if this was the case, it would not provide enough of a separation of the militia from the federal government and the goal of preserving the security of a free state. It would be too close to the control of the federal government to preserve this free state should the federal government go tyrannical and start dismantling the militia or removing rights of gun ownership. It would make no sense for the Second Amendment, which was written as a protection from the federal government over natural rights, to also have that right act as a grant of power from the federal government. It's completely asinine and incongruent with anything. 
well-regulated is not a grant of regulation to the federal government when literally the entire purpose of its existence is to declare an individual right that is out of the range of government interference. All able-bodied men are considered to be part of the overall unorganized militia, who are allowed individually, or in concert, to train and discipline themselves in the basics of military tactics in order to be ready to face any threats to the security of a free state. Which leads us to the last phrase of analysis, security of a free state. Now this doesn't mean the security of each individual state, but to the security of a free polity, or the entirety of the organized society. Moreover, the other instances of state in the Constitution are typically accompanied by modifiers making clear that the reference is to the several states. Each state, several states, any state, that state, particular states, one state, no state, and the presence of the term foreign state in Article 1 and Article 3 shows that the word state did not have a single meaning in the Constitution. And so as argued by the founders, militias are useful for repelling invasions, suppressing insurrections, rendering large standing armies unnecessary, and resisting government tyranny. So, now that we're all grammar Nazi'd out, and after all this historical, legal, and textual analysis has been laid out before you, does the prefatory clause fit in conjunction with an operative clause that creates an individual right to keep and bear arms? Yes. The history showed that the way tyrants had eliminated a militia consisting of all the able-bodied men was not by banning the militia, but simply by taking away the people's arms, enabling a select militia or standing army to suppress political opponents. This is what had occurred in England that prompted codification of the right to have arms in the English Bill of Rights. The founders were never arguing over whether or not such a natural right existed, but whether or not it had to be protected from the federal government and codified into the Constitution. The prefatory clause clearly indicates that because preventing the elimination of the militia is of utmost importance to the security of a free state, you cannot disarm the people, because the people make up the militia. And the most effective way to prevent the existence of a citizen's militia is to disarm the people. Thereby, the people have the right to keep and bear arms. What country can preserve its liberties if their rulers are not warned from time to time that their people preserve the spirit of resistance? Let them take arms. So now that we've laid out the facts behind the Second Amendment, we need to get into all the other myths surrounding the issue. Though now that we've established this framework, it really makes tackling all the other myths a lot easier. So when you're arguing with someone who doesn't like evidence, or at least only cares about evidence when it supports their vision of the world, they like to do what's called moving the goalpost. So someone who's still watching and just lost all basis for their argument on it only applies to militias, will now move the goalpost over to it only applies to muskets. Now, if someone is still trying to make that argument at this point in the video, they really weren't paying attention to the last 40 minutes, because it was essentially already dispelled with. But hey, let's get into it. No, the Second Amendment does not only apply to muskets. You'd think my bit earlier on the definition of arms would have already taken care of this, but no. First and foremost, the majority of the Founding Fathers who signed the Constitution and took office in Congress were all lawyers. If they wanted to limit the Second Amendment to muskets, they would have wrote a singular object of a musket rather than writing arms. Secondly, this is not how we interpret constitutional amendments. If we interpreted amendments as only pertaining to the material objects of the time, then literally every single word I have been uttering is not protected under law. Because you see, the First Amendment doesn't protect speech in YouTube videos, because in the Founders' days, they didn't have YouTube, did they? They only had parchment, quill, and newspapers. See? I'm logicking! I'm doing logic! Eh? Yeah, no. These amendments apply to all forms of modern uses, and that includes all instruments that constitute bearable arms, even those that were not in existence at the time of the Founding. For anyone to think that messages they send on their iPhones are not protected under the First Amendment is absolutely ridiculous. And the same applies to the Second Amendment and muskets. And as I already stated before, arms, back during the ratification of the Second Amendment, meant weapons of offense or armor of defense. It does not mean freaking muskets. So now that that argument has been taken care of, the goalpost will probably shift over to, well, they only knew about muskets. Uh, what? Okay, so this argument seems to try and justify the former unfounded argument by trying to say that the only weapons in use at the time were muskets, so even if they didn't specifically say muskets, they only had muskets. So, I suppose in order for you to take up this argument, you need to be really ignorant on the history of firearms. And you have to also think that the Founding Fathers were just straight up morons who had no capacity to think ahead or ponder about what the future might look like. Hey George. Yeah? 
What if guns, like, get better? The argument usually goes something along the lines of, look at this musket. It's from the days of the founding fathers. It only shot one round every minute. They never expected a gun would exist that could shoot more than one round every minute. Therefore, only muskets. Well, history doesn't really support this argument either. So let's just take a look back in time at all the weapons that existed and existed hundreds of years before the second amendment was ever written that shot more than one round at a time. Ever heard of hand cannons? These things were first created in the 13th century and introduced to Europe as early as the 14th century. Later renditions included hand cannons that can shoot up to 10 rounds. Ever heard of volley guns? This one's got up to 20 barrels. 16th century stuff, man. How about the duck foot pistol? That looks like more than one round to me. What about the pepper box revolvers? These things were around for hundreds of years before the second amendment and can hold up to 20 rounds. Hey, here's a gun that was developed during the Revolutionary War, the Belton Flintlock. And according to Joseph Belton, the guy who made it, it could fire up to eight rounds with one loading. Eight balls, one after another, in eight, five, or three seconds of time. He also had a way of modifying this gun to fire 16 to 20 rounds at a time. Oh, and the Founding Fathers specifically knew about this one. You know how we know that? Because the guy who made this gun tried to sell it to them at the Continental Congress. Yeah! Now unfortunately for him, they didn't end up buying his gun. But you better believe they had knowledge of a gun that could fire multiple rounds within seconds with one trigger pull. Oh shit, uh, right, uh, cross that out, uh, uh, right of the people to keep and bear arms, uh, except for this belt and flintlock thing, because it, it fires multiple rounds and that's scary, uh. Or hey, what about the Girondoni air rifle? This was already in service in the Austrian army by 1780 and used in the Napoleonic Wars, well over a decade before the Second Amendment was ratified and could fire 20 rounds from a magazine in less than 30 seconds. Not only that, Thomas Jefferson used this gun to outfit the Lewis and Clark expedition with. In Meriwether Lewis's first diary entry, he mentions how he demonstrated the firepower of the air rifle to the people living on Bruno's Island. In fact, they nearly killed a woman when Mr. Blaze Sinus, being unacquainted with the management of the gun, suffered her to discharge herself accidentally. The ball passed through the hat of the woman about 40 yards distant, cutting her temple about the fourth of the diameter of the ball. She fell instantly and the blood gushing from her temple. We were all in the greatest consternation. Suppose she was dead, but in a minute, she revived to our inexpressible satisfaction. And by examination, we found the wound by no means mortal or even dangerous. They traveled across the entire United States with this gun and showed it off to various Indian tribes as they went along. Oh, and also, it's not a musket, it's a rifle. Or hey, what about the puckle gun? This was patented in 1718 and was one of the first machine guns or prototype Gatling guns ever created that could fire 63 rounds in 7 minutes. Or before that, there was the Kalthoff repeater, which could fire up to 6, 7, 12, or even 30 shots that could be reloaded in 1 to 2 seconds. So all of these guns had either existed before or during the time of the Revolutionary War and the ratification of the Second Amendment. There weren't just muskets in the world, people. Alright, I think that just about wraps it up for the Second Amendment arguments. There's still a bunch of other gun-related myths out there with things regarding semi-automatic weapons and firearms licensing and the such, but that's more of a gun control issue than it is pertaining directly to the Second Amendment. But with all the contemporary Second Amendment issues, there's one more goalpost that this debate shifts to, and that's your racist. Okay, yeah, we're done here. If I have to say one thing on the semi-automatic rifle conflict though, just know that more people are killed from knives, clubs, hammers, and bare hands and feet in this country than are killed by assault rifles. Now, if you don't like guns, or don't like the Second Amendment in general, or are in favor of certain gun control policies, you can take that stance, and you can try to argue and reason for that stance. What you can't do is to start lying about the Second Amendment and what it has meant and been interpreted to mean for centuries. That's not going to help you. And in my opinion, the 1846 Supreme Court case of Nunn v. Georgia sums all of this up perfectly. The right of the people to bear arms shall not be infringed. The right of the whole people, old and young, men, women, and boys, and not militia only, to keep and bear arms of every description, not such merely as are used by the militia, shall not be infringed, curtailed, or broken in upon in the smallest degree. And all this for the important end to be attained, the rearing up and qualifying a well-regulated militia so vitally necessary to the security of a free state. 
Our opinion is that any law, state or federal, is repugnant to the Constitution and void, which contravenes this right, originally belonging to our forefathers, trampled underfoot by Charles I and his two wicked sons and successors, re-established by the Revolution of 1688, conveyed to this land of liberty by the colonists, and finally incorporated conspicuously in our own Magna Carta. It was clear in the 18th century what the Second Amendment meant. It was clear in the 19th century. It was clear before ratification. It was clear after ratification. This is what the Second Amendment has always meant throughout its entire history, and always will mean.